a very good afternoon to to everybody um, who's come. This is the last webinar of our series um, jointly between Team Police and Police Sport UK. Um, just a little bit, a little bit of background. Team Police, we basically are partners with Police Sport UK, and we exist primarily to work with business partner sponsors to raise much needed funds to support and enhance sport in policing right across the United Kingdom, which in itself then supports the well-being, both physical and mental well-being of everybody in the service itself. So aptly today, we've, we've titled our webinar, Anyone for Cricket? As I look out my window and it's nice, nice and sunny, uh, it always makes you feel a little bit uh, like cricket's here. First of all, I'd like to introduce um, Rick Martin, uh, captain of the men's police police cricket, and um, Mandy. Um, forgive me, Mandy. Is it is it Mackerjee? Mageki. Mageki. Sorry, I knew I was going to want uh, the captain of the women's police cricket team, and uh, Simon Frank, CEO of Anatomat, um, our sponsor for this um, event, and um, also like to introduce. Um, uh, Lucy Dorsey, Chief Constable of British Transport Police. I'm just going to pause for a second uh, just to um, note and congratulate you, Lucy, on um, your um, uh, honours at the QPM. Well done, well deserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. And apparently, according to Simon Cole, you originate from Leicester, which he says is the sporting capital of the world. <laughs> he is right. I am a Leicester girl, very much so. So, um... Yeah, so I, I think my, my Leicester friends and family are, are very, very um, proud and very pleased for me. So that's great. I hope it inspires all the other girls in Leicester that they can either join policing or they can achieve success in their life. Absolutely. Um, so, um, well, whilst we're reading Simon Cole, I want to um, uh, just emphasise the fact that we can only run these webinars um, with the help of our, our business sponsors. So I'm very grateful to Simon. Um, and that's about uh, making this actually happen. And um, I'd just like to, first of all, introduce Simon, just to say a few words, um, just to introduce Anatomy, uh, what you're about, and um, maybe, if you can, Simon, a little bit about what sport wellbeing means for you. Over to you, Simon. Sure, uh, Gavin, thanks very much. Um, so I, I, can I just first of all start by publicly thanking Dave Fraser-Darling, who I, I think is on the call, um, for initially asking us to support Team Police. Um, I think it's a great initiative and one that I was very keen to support having been made aware of it. Um, essentially for me, anything we can do in life to help and support those who seek every day to support our society is, is a real winner. Um, and I don't want to bore you here because I know we're really here to talk about all things uh, cricket and not apps. Um, but if I may, I just wanted to take five minutes really just to summarize what an Atom app does and outline how we're trying to do our bit to help victims and our wider society. Um, so in summary, the app is called Injury Capture um, for the reason that we're initially focused on violent crime, including assault, domestic abuse, and sexual offenses. Eventually, B2 will probably become evidence capture. But the app essentially for the moment, its goals really are to one, empower victims to report a crime, two, to allow anyone to capture, store, and submit enhanced forensic evidence, three, hopefully boosting conviction rates, and four, therefore building public trust and safeguarding our communities. How does it do it? So essentially the app allows anyone to capture, retain, and submit to the police photographs, data, and information, which is forensic in nature and immediately evidentially admissible. We're including, of course, within that photographs of injuries, but also associated data, text messages, voice recordings, and media, images of the scene, CCTV, videos, etc., all of which are captured together with its metadata. And if another person has data or evidence, they can be invited to the case to contribute that. And again, that will be with all of its metadata and evidentially admissible. Once the person chooses to submit it to the police, it can then be reviewed in a full digital format by an officer. But more than that, the system also also populates all of the data into pre-prepared CPR compliant witness statements in order that it can be immediately presented in interview. So essentially, by enhancing the evidence collection and speeding up dramatically the pace at which that can be presented, 
We hope to help in obtaining more early guilty pleas, which means that victims can be more effectively and quickly safeguarded. If we can achieve that and boost prosecution rates, then we can rapidly build public trust, empowering more victims and in the long term, hopefully reduce offending rates. Those who contemplate violent crime with whether that be assault, domestic abuse or sexual offences, knowing that they will be caught and successfully prosecuted. Essentially, we're hoping to improve policing outcomes, protect the vulnerable and all whilst actually reducing police resource. Um, the app and surrounding ecosystem is all completely developed and accredited and we are now in talks with a number of forces regarding their consumption of the data in order that we can make it available for public use in those areas. Um, and if I may say, if, if, if any force would like a demonstration to see its functionality and discuss making it available to victims in your force area, then please do just get in touch. I'll put my details in the chat. Um, just on a final few notes, um, we're fully Microsoft based. We have single sign on implemented um, and we can seamlessly integrate with Teams, Power BI platforms or whatever else is required. Um, and then just to come full circle, really in terms of supporting police officers more directly, um, we'll all be aware that it's not just the public that are victims, sadly, to, to assault and, and crime, but indeed police officers themselves. Um, and I'm aware that, that last year, I think there were about 40,000 assaults on officers. Um, the app's built for anyone to use, whether they be a member of the public, a medical professional, or indeed a police officer. Um, the NEP are currently looking at how assaults on officers can be better recorded and officers better supported. And we're currently in early talks with them to see if we can leverage what we've already created to support police officers and quickly prosecute those who assault those who look after us. Um, the app also encourages and helps victims to access support services. And we plan hopefully with the NEP to do the same for officers. Um, and we also have the support of um, senior management of victimsupport.org.uk, who are the, one of the largest organizations who have seen huge potential for it to help support victims and survivors and police forces with their VCOP compliance. Um, so that stumps on me for now, but before I hand back, just to start off all things cricket and get back to what I'm sure everyone wants to discuss, um, I just thought I'd leave you with um, three motivational quotes um, that I found from famous Christians, which I really liked. Um, the first one is from Wakim Akram, and he said, uh, first of all, convince yourself that you are the best because the rest of your life is going to go proving this to others. Uh, Sachin Tendulkar, when people throw stones at you, turn them into milestones. Uh, and finally, Adam Gilchrist, a wise man learns by the mistakes of others, a fool by their own. And Simon, on that note, I'm back. Thank you, Simon. And I, I think uh, cricket is, um, is awash with um, quotes um, like that, um, which we may well pick up again as we, we start this conversation. Um, I'd like to, at this, uh, at this juncture, um, bring in um, Mick and Mandy. Um, Mandy, um, I'd just like to um, start with you, if I may, and just ask you where, where you started with cricket. How did you get interested in cricket and, and how did you start your journey, you know, with the game itself? Yeah, so I, I guess from a very early age, I've always been absolutely sport mad. Um, would go regularly with my dad at a weekend to cricket. He was a keen cricketer. Uh, so went along with him as a, as a probably 10, 12 year old every weekend. Uh, would pitch up there and there'd be a load of lads playing cricket. And I thought, well, you know, let, let's have a go. So I'd play cricket with them. And it wasn't until I was about 15 when I started doing the cricket tees for my dad's team. Uh, and they had a cricket week um, and I looked out on the pitch and, and there was somebody wearing a skirt and I thought oh this this is interesting I didn't know that ladies played cricket so uh, was obviously really keen to, to have a conversation with, with that lady at the time and that's pretty much how it started and so I've been playing cricket for many many years um, represented both Surrey and Middlesex at junior level and senior county level uh, young England and in and out of the England training squads for many many years uh, I stopped playing cricket uh, probably in about 2001, took a, took a 17 year break, had two young children, two boys who um, I pretty much put a cricket bat in their hand as soon as they were able to, to hold it. Uh, one of them, a very good cricketer, since coached his team. Uh, such was my love of cricket that I thought I'm not finished with cricket yet uh, and went back to playing cricket um, probably about three or four years ago. 
uh, for my for my club um, enjoyed it I'd been playing stool ball in that time and for people who don't know stool ball it's a it's a mixture of rounders and cricket so I'd kept up my ball skills mm. uh, kept up my cricketing sort of attributes through coaching as well um, so started playing back at my club uh, and then the opportunity came along um, last year I, I saw the advert to, to go to the trials for the British police cricket I knew that the year before they run some trials and I thought, yes, you know, I, I would really like to have an opportunity to be part of part of this team. And so went along and uh, was absolutely delighted and honoured to be asked to be captain. Um, you know, why would you not take that up if you're offered it? I mean, I think it's absolutely tremendous for me. Uh, it came at a, a very good time in my policing career. I had just retired from the Met. So 30 years in the Met, uh, I'd played cricket within the police uh, at that time whether it was through through the cadet route, the cadet versus commissioner game uh, many, many years ago that went on to the training school annual event against the then commissioner, Sir Peter Imbert, um, and then took up cricket for the for the local station side in Kingston, uh, where I subsequently met my husband who was playing playing cricket at the time. Uh, and it's been a love of, since that time. So so on and off, but obviously delighted to have come from the tour only a fortnight ago. Um, which I think was absolutely tremendous. Uh, can't thank enough for the support team that we had in putting that together. And I know Dave Fraser Darling is on this call and, um, and I've already expressed my thanks to him, but I think, you know, this is a great forum to also add that further wider thanks to him and the support team and everybody who was involved in that. Um, I know equally there are a couple of players that have joined this session and it really was a, a tremendous tour. So absolutely great and, and I'm thrilled to bits. Mandy, thank you. I'll, I'll come back um, a, a bit about um, about you know, women's police cricket as well. But um, Mick, what about you? Where where did cricket start with you in your life? Uh, similar to Mandy, really. At very young age, um, used to get two buses with with my old man, um, hop into town and then hop up the hill, and and we, you know, um, me and my brother carried his bat, bags and bats and he went off and played for the day so we were in the nets all, all day so say from a, a very young age of uh, six I was always down my club in which I'm, I am at now um, and from there say go, went through all our youth systems to say very blessed that my, you know again my father was the coach with a, with another uh, other dads at the time obviously structures were completely different back then to, to what they are now that is for sure um, and yeah, just obviously then ended up playing representative cricket growing up, uh, growing up, and then went off to uni uh, and managed to play for Cardiff UC UCC. So played a bit of you know effect effectively um, second eleven and, and and pro stuff. You know played you know some lovely grounds and uh, and, a, and a real good standard. Um, uh, and from there, you know, I've played in and around all, all South Wales for various different clubs and played at the obviously the highest league standard I could play at for for a number of years. Um, and say I was, I was lucky enough then obviously to, to join the job um, and didn't even know, you know, cricket existed within within Gwent Police at the time. Um, and I, I think that the side had actually fallen through it through at that point and a couple of the South Wales boys um, asked asked us to amalgamate, and we've been amalgamated since 2012, I believe. And with the year we amalgamated together, we went went all the way, and uh, and uh, obviously won won the, uh, the the championship, which was a which was, was a cracking achievement for us. Um, and I was lucky enough to to go and score a turn in the final that day. Obviously caught beef side, and think you know since then I've been part of the the British police family and haven't really looked back. It's been a it's been a cracking journey. I got to be fair, and one I certainly don't want to to end anytime soon. That is for sure. Fantastic. Uh, I think you know, what's coming across from both of you is your sort of infectious love and enthusiasm for the game of cricket, which is which is wonderful. Um, Mick, Mick, I'll ask you where. where you know, I made that throwaway remark a short while ago about um, obviously the New Zealand Test um, and uh, England cricket team. Um, but what, what, where, in your view, is the state of British police cricket at the moment? Um, what sort of health is it in? Well, when I when I first first joined, um, 
Uh, well, I, I, I only got, I found out through it through um, through an ex-pro Ryan Watkins who was who was been part of the committee and subsequently left the job, unfortunately. So obviously won't won't be part part of it moving forward. But uh, when I when I joined, uh, I was I, I think we had two tours that year. So there was the June and the July tour, and I I, I was on the July tour where um, it was effectively. Um, a, tr a trial tour, so see who could, you know, they they got their bubble or their their core players for the following year, and then I, I luckily enough, I I had a pretty good week, and so I've I've not I've not looked back since. Um, since then, we've probably had our ups and our downs. We've you know we've we we've, we've struggled a bit in terms of um, in tr maybe trying to get the right the right structure or the right players, because again, you're relying on on sections and captains and secretaries of sections to to put people forward um and when people they put people forwards you know sometimes you know they they're not quite up to the standard that we would expect for the week um which you know you you're sort of relying on other people's cricketing knowledge and uh, of other cricketers and it it is it's been difficult but because because well I say this is my what are we now? I think this is my eighth year now as, as part of the group, uh, and I've been captain four or five. Um, got a great line of communication with Beef. We've looked at you know a, a lot of cricketers now, and obviously with the structure um, of the national championship now changing into a league format, um, mm. you you can really have a look. And you know before yeah. you were going, you, you could go to to Northern Ireland, go to Scotland, go go up to Northumbria or down to Devon. Whereas now, you, you know, you are playing local forces and then obviously it goes further afield. So you do get to know more people within those teams and structures and play against them more regularly because they're not traveling as far. So the, I would say in terms of the national championships, that's getting stronger. And as a consequence, we're getting stronger. I know um, I know Beef has got, got a couple of other things in place as well you know it didn't happen this year due to due to covid but we're um we were due to go to Loughborough for a weekend for obviously a trial weekend so we would pick a big squad and then we would pick the players that we want from that squad moving forward obviously we literally see the talent ourselves in front of us and then we pick the squad that that we think will do the best in the week uh so in terms of where it where it where it, where, I've, where it started and where I, we are now, we're in a far much better, stronger position, you know, than, than when I started uh, back in 2012. That is for sure. Be Beef's done an absolutely cracking job. That's good to hear. Thanks, mate. Mandy, what uh, what, what sort of health is uh, women's police cricket in at the moment? Uh, I think many, many years ago, um, certainly my, my early recollections of, of playing cricket, there, there was a, a representative time within within the Met at that point in time. And I think um, possibly that was in the day when when women's cricket was um, it, it was known, but it wasn't particularly well funded, wasn't particularly well, well supported. Um, the Met, I'm not aware that the Met has a ladies team now, which is which is such a shame. Uh, mm. But I think certainly the, the benefits from the tour are that there was there was good representation from a number of forces. And I'm hoping that one of the key benefits from that is that that desire to play cricket will perhaps lead those individuals to perhaps seek out other individuals that they're in with their force with mm. a view to perhaps seeing whether that's an option going forwards for their respective forces. Um, I think I think one of the, the benefits too of, of the tour is that that bringing together of people from lots of different areas of policing, you know, to to have that camaraderie and and it was actually really quite infectious and and the desire to play cricket with that link to, to policing was phenomenal and such was the enthusiasm. I think that it's in a fantastic position now. Um, I have every confidence that year on year there'll be more people that want to be part of it. Um, certainly that's the impression that I got and, and it was absolutely tremendous. So I think this is this is something that was there, it's gone away, it's now back there firmly on the map and I think it's got potential to expand um, and I would certainly love to see it. I'm sure the other players would love to see it continue in a broader sense but across more forces. So just pick up on that point, Mandy, how, how do you think we, we can collectively support the sport of cricket in policing to make it expand and make it grow from where it is now? What, what's um, needed? 
Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's the, the, the tour, obviously, I think is the foundation and it's, and it's a question of then tapping into those people that were on the tour for them to get the messages out to, to their forces to, to really promote sport generally. I mean, you know, we talk about wellbeing and I think it's got tremendous benefits, um, uh, you know, and it's going to need perhaps people to, to take up the mantle and to, and to sell it as a really positive aspect yeah. um, in relation to policing. Mm. What about you, Mick? Well, how do you think um, we can take the men's game, you know, forwards and upwards uh, in terms of supporting it, funding, organisation? Because you you talked you talked a minute ago about you know the, the, how the structures were perhaps an inhibitor, but now with the leagues, it's going to be a bit better to be able to find players. How, how um, can we... Well, I I I think. You know, I, I've been part of the committee for a, for a couple of years now, and obviously we do have very healthy discussions come September time. But um, I think the structure we've got in place uh, just just encourages more and more people to to join join their their uh, respective sides within within their force. Um, in terms of funding, um, obviously, I again speaking to Beef, you know, the the, the team team police and ethos through that um, it is going to really help promote cricket and you say once once we're you know you get your name out there you know it, it, it's you know it, it, you do really start to gather gather momentum and I think we're we're really doing well with that at the moment. How important is funding to you both? In terms on, of man. support how important yeah. is funding? Yeah I mean I think you know um there has to be funding I think to, to try and support events like this uh, funding yeah. can always be a bit of a challenge um, yeah. but you know I, I, it's a difficult one isn't it and um, yeah. you know I don't know what Mick's thoughts are I've only just done one tour but Mick's probably done yeah. several more so I don't know in your what do you think Mick? Uh, in terms of funding funding for the tour Beef does an absolutely magnificent job and I think we, we you know we do really well well with that um in terms of myself and say I'm, I'm treasurer for, for for gwent in south wales um again it's just it's just having the right things in place um th there's never an issue with it um unfortunately oh, i say unfortunately cricket is a pretty expensive sport um when it comes to when you're away, away in places or you need you know tees umpires officials you know football and rugby can can be a, a lot cheaper so in terms of the, the the way the funding works within within the two forces um south wales i i i ask the the, the guy who runs it all uh, and he he pretty much writes writes the check or does the bank transfer straight away which is quite nice but because we're over two forces it does it is a lot trickier um and obviously they, they match each other and obviously that has its own selection headaches when i got three quarters of a psych south wales or quarter of gwent or vice versa and everything else but in general they're very supportive and like with everything at the moment with physical and mental well-being you say you they'd be stupid not to as well to be honest yeah and i want to come back to the physical and uh, mental well-being aspect of sport in a few minutes i want to bring lucy in um uh, in a few minutes but before i do i just wanted to ask another question of you both really um you both referred to this in terms of how you attract new players you know so i mean you you your experience when you joined gwent you didn't even know that gwent had a, a cricket team how well advertised how well communicated is is this within the service you know, i think mad you mentioned that the met don't don't have a women's team at the moment which i was surprised actually when you said that so how how how, do, how is it communicated how is it to sort of encourage new players to come and have a go and get involved Mick? Um, well, with us, it's all done via uh, an internal intranet page. As you say, you go on there, and and each each section has their own has their own their own page, and is able to maintain it and and look at it. Uh, and again, there's somebody who oversees it all, and we you know you advertise that way. The biggest one for me is word of mouth. It, it, you know, yeah. cr cr cricketing is a very um, very close community um wherever you are and you know players no players no players no players so you know when oh so-and-so's joining the job right okay sign him up you know it's it you know 
Beef's found this with the, with obviously the national stuff. We've we've managed to obviously sign a couple of ex ex county players this year as well. So again, oh, he's joining the job. We'll get him in. So it's just having that word of mouth and having you know, just like like Mandy said with the women the women's cricket. If you literally got everybody from all around the country coming together to play for this you know this tour from one great week of cricket, but as you say, it it then. Oh, so and so should be on this tour. So and so should be. Oh, he's just about to join the job, and it's it's generally word, word of mouth within within my own force. It's just it's just maintained via via an internet page and via the secretaries of each section. Mm. Mandy, what about women's cricket? How how is it communicated or promulgated around the forces to try and attract new new people, new talent to come into cricket? Yeah, I, th I, I think it's, it's quite limited, to, to be honest. Um, I, I would say when I first joined the job many years ago, the, the sports mm. facilities and the encouragement to play sport was very clear. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's kind of gone away a little bit um, for, for many years and for a number of reasons, um, you know, slight restrictions perhaps on, on being released to play sport or, or other mm. implications that mean that people aren't so keen to do it. But it, it certainly got a place. And, and, and I think it's a question of then selling that message again, that police sport exists, whatever sport you want yeah. to play, um, it exists. Um, you know, whether it be through the sailing club, whether it's hockey, whether it's football, whatever it is, just the whole ethos of police sport probably needs to be put back firmly on that map. And obviously cricket is a big part of that. Um, how you do that is probably tricky. Uh, I, I don't know, but I think it's probably across all sports, not just cricket. Thank you, Mandy. Um, Lucy, I'd just like to bring you in at this point, if I may, just to perhaps start with your your reflections. I know you're you're involved in PS UK and in cricket and in the cricket as well. But uh, just your thoughts initially, please. I'm just checking. There's no other Lucys on the line apart from me, Gavin. <laughs> no, there's only you, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've managed to change my background really. So uh, I'm very new to the world of cricket. Is probably the easiest uh, way of summarising my knowledge. Although I come from a a family that were very uh, big uh, into cricket. So um, Simon's right, I was, I'm from Leicester. Um, my father's family are from a little village called Rothley, for any of you who may or may not have heard of it. And most people had never heard of Rothley actually. Um, in fact, it was where Madeleine McCann was from. So it sort of put it on that um, global map. But my, um, my great grandfather was connected with the Rothley Cricket Club and all my uncles played. Um, and um, but my father was uh, an avid watcher of cricket, but never um, actually played himself. So I don't really know an awful lot about cricket. I have found that YouTube is a really good point of knowledge. Um, so I have been sort of I told my husband, which he found rather amusing, that I was going to teach myself cricket via YouTube. And he thought that that was just like an impossible um, task. So I was delighted that um, Simon asked me if I would join the committee because for me, and you know, Mandy's touched on it slightly, but the position of um, women in sport is something that I feel really strongly about. I would never, I know you started by saying you've always been passionately into sport. I was somebody as a six foot um, person at school, I was always encouraged to play netball. And I think I rebelled against sport because I always just got put in the boring position um, in netball as goalkeeper. So I very much um, rebelled and I was more into my music, but latterly in my life, sport is, is something that I feel is really an intrinsic part of well-being. It's something that as a chief officer, I always try to make sure that I find the time um, to keep up with exercise. Um, my daughter plays in a rugby team, um, O2 Touch Rugby, and I very much from her perspective, it's not about wanting to be the next sort of England's um, rugby female rugby player but actually it's about well-being so I am a real supporter of it I think there are some real challenges you know Mandy very much reflected back in in the Met um, you know sort of my previous force about certainly when I joined in the in the early 90s and my husband joined in the 80s we were talking about it was very much a part of Met life in terms of access to sport and I think in terms of public service we've definitely gone through a, a real journey around the tension of requiring police officers to be doing policing 
as opposed to sport. Um, but actually, I, I do agree with Mandy's point. I think there is, uh, is a way that how we can we re-energise um, people's interest in sport, playing it competitively for the forces in a way that doesn't undermine uh, the role of spending the public pound, but actually recognises the benefit of it from a well-being um, perspective. And I think there's so much academic research out there that shows the benefit um, of sport um, for your own personal mental well-being that I'm really keen to um, support it. And, and I suppose with cricket, it's, you know, for me, it's a bit like cricket, rugby, football, empowering women to have a, um, you know, if it's something that they want to do, that they've got, got a right and access to doing that. Uh, and even recently, you know, my, husband, my daughter told a sports teacher, could she play the rugby? And he told her that girls didn't play rugby. And I just sort of think this uh, is like 2021. It's just a completely yeah. unacceptable position um, to take. So um, I suppose I look at So I therefore probably look at it with two lens. Um, you know, one is actually... Um, you know, learning to love the sport, which again, um, of cricket, which everyone tells me that I will do, um, and making the time to sort of enjoy that, to support those of you that are involved in it, um, push it from the well-being perspective, um, but obviously a huge interest in it from uh, a sort of equality perspective and how uh, the role of women in sport um, can be amplified. Interestingly, I particularly chose this back backdrop when I was just... Uh, just looking through to try and put one up there because it was actually a correspondent that was actually uh, put this on um, an article that they'd written which was around um, there is professing that there is no comparable between women in cricket and men in cricket a debate question mark and I thought uh, it was quite a controversial photo to put up because I'm not so sure I'm entirely in the same space as the individual wanted to make that commentary but and you know Mandy you know thanks very much for stepping up um, to be the captain. I, I think, you know, most people, it's important to step into the arena and be that visible role model. So if people can see it, they believe that they can do it, which I think is fantastic. Thank you, Lucy. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I've got um, uh, two daughters, my youngest who is sports mad, who is currently running a petition at her school to get a girls cricket team going because mm. You know, there's still that bias, frankly, uh, even right. within the education system, of why you know girls can't play rugby or can't play cricket, which is absolutely crazy. I mean, like you, I I I, I follow cricket a little bit, and my knowledge is very scant. But I I did a little bit of research just before I came on the webinar. The, the first women's test was in the 1930s. This is not a new phenomena as a sport for women. It's been around nearly as long, well, as long as men have been playing cricket. It's just the fact that it's been biased over that time in terms of skewed towards men in you know, being recognised as playing cricket rather than women. So yeah. it's something there which I think does need correcting, um, not only, you know, what in wider society as a whole, but Mandy, is that something you find in policing at all, that, that bias at all? Uh, yes, I, I, I guess um, slightly. Uh, I, I can recall many, many years ago uh, playing at Invercourt for, for the local station side and, and my dad had actually come along to watch uh, and I was fielding, uh, batsman took, took a quick, quick single and I was fielding, picked it up underarm pick up and throw and straight in and, and took, the, took the bales off actually broke the bales and uh, as the batsman left the field he actually said to my dad not realizing it was my dad shouldn't let women play this sport which was absolutely incredible and um, uh, and of course my dad told me that and of course that just spurs me on to play even more and I think you know it's about getting that message out that that women can play cricket as they can play football as they can play lots of other sports and vice versa you know it's not gender specific um, yeah. and and so you know women's women's cricket has thrived absolutely thrived since it's merged with the ECB um, the England women's cricket team you know are absolutely phenomenal um, and you know watching that should hopefully inspire those officers who come in who are keen to play cricket to get involved in police cricket you know that real team ethos which I'm a, a real believer in and a firm driver of and um, you know if we can encourage that then that would be absolutely fantastic. I mean Lucy I mean one of the things that we're going to probably pick up some common themes which have been picked up 
through the, the webinars, which um, we fed back to um, PS UK. But uh, certainly a couple of things that have been highlighted is the value of um, people um, competing in a, in a team sport, being part of a team and what that means in terms of translating those skills and that thought processes into the workplace and the value that holds. But um, more importantly, the, the value of individuals' health and mental well-being, particularly in the current period which we're going through and the demands on the service itself. How do we, how do we start to pick this up? Um, and I know this is a really difficult question, but, and I'm sure this is going to come out in the questions. How do we start to, to pick this up through PSUK to get some sort of, um, I suppose, common approach across the service to address well-being both physically and mentally through sport? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's, I'm not sure I'm entirely sort of up to speed on it all to give you a really sort of defined answer on it, but I, I do think this is something about, you know, at Chief, uh, certainly at Chiefs Council, how we sort of put value on discussing um, sport as a holistic category, and I think you're absolutely right, Gavin, the benefit of team sports. I mean, I often use I often use cricket, ironically, even though I don't really know it that well, I often use it as an example when we're talking about performance. And I always say that, you know, people shy away from talking about, you know, how are we going to deliver performance and what conversations we're going to have about the performance. And it, I always say, you know, you know, we, we shy away from from almost doing the obvious, which in cricket, you know, you don't, I imagine you don't play a test match. You don't not count the runs because you don't know whether you don't count the runs, you don't know whether you're going to stand a chance. And But at tea break, just because it's not going very well, doesn't mean to say that you have to have an aggressive conversation about it. And cricket is a really good example of having a longer term plan over a period of time, um, you know, in order to drive forward your performance to ultimately to win. And I think how we talk about performance as a team in the workplace is intrinsically linked with that. So, you know, if I look at the units that I've been in in policing particularly the sort of territorial support group um, you know it's very team spirited and actually it does a good job because people work together quite consistently as a team so um, I think it's really difficult I mean I was listening with interest the funding issue at, at the beginning and of course that's really difficult when we're talking about public um, money but I think moving it away from some of the historical debates around sport into the point of well-being and putting it very 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 front and center in terms of being um, all the benefits that come with it in terms of you know time away from work working collaboratively as a team the support that you get from a from a team and actually that you learn to operate well together as a team I mean we know that that's the most successful teams are the ones that work collaboratively uh, and are honest with each other. And that's in, in sport as much as it is anywhere else. So, I mean, I'm not sure what Simon's thoughts are on progressing it sort of nationally, but, you know, I think probably we just simply don't have enough conversations around the benefit of sport within the workplace. And that's how we amplify that message and have those discussions more. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I, you know, I mean, just listening to the conversation that we've had so far, I was just messaging back to work just to ask them some questions around, you know, what it, what is our position on sport within the workplace and how do we, you know, have we got a policy about whether we support the abstraction in work time for that or not? Because that's what ultimately people are looking for. It's really it difficult to give up your spare time to play a sport when you've got probably the challenges um, uh, challenges of play uh, you know of family time as well so I think it is a it is a difficult question because it is about time off um, and, and really you ha we have to bring into that public perception we can't abrogate our consciousness no. around the public perception of people being paid public money to play sport and we have to uh, find we have to take a position at some point on that and I think you're right. I think that's where the, 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 a debate needs to happen um, within the, the, the service, probably within PSUK on this. But uh, uh, just a couple of things, Lucy. So in terms of the funding, that's the part, I suppose, the rationale as to why Team Police exists to, to try and help 
um, with business sponsors to try and inject, um, that's the ambition, to try and inject some funding into Pierce UK to support uh, sport in policing itself. Um, I've just got an interesting comment actually from um, somebody who's on the webinar um, around um, the experience. The, the last police championship game saw two teams play cricket, ages between 20 and 55 years of age, police staff, PCs, chief superintendents, years of service, three months to 30 years, male and female, multiple ethnicities, all as equals, all in the same game, um, real example of inclusivity through sport mm. and moving in the right direction. So there's some, there's, there's some, there's some, there's some positives in this, which are perhaps not being recognised or picked up within the service at the moment. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, sport is often a great leveller, isn't it, in terms of diversity and inclusion, uh, and you know, ultimately, I think that's why, obviously, most people really enjoy sport who participate in it. So, I don't think that the I don't think that the argument isn't made out. I think it's a really strong argument about the benefits of sport within in the workplace. I, I do come back to, you know, this is, it is the sort of public perception, political perception, probably slightly less so, but definitely the public perception of, of um, you mm. know, using, spending the public purse and, and articulating um, the benefits of that. And I suppose particularly if you take it, from communities where you know they're really struggling with levels of violence and crime and everything and is it seen as palatable to be abstracting police officers predominantly yeah. uh, but yeah. is it seen as palatable to abstract police officers in order to um you know i suppose if you look at it clinically go and play sport now you know that's not necessarily my view but i think that's something that we have to have in our real consciousness and uh, think about how how we're positioning that because that uh, obviously you can't look at it in isolation of one sport. You've got to look at it in terms of the breadth of sports that are out there, which could significantly abstract people from the workplace. Yeah. And then it has a counter impact on well-being because somebody's still got to, you know, open the shop and make sure that you know we're we're delivering a service to the public. Yeah. So somebody has to do that, and then potentially in the cyclical process, you end up with other people having leave cancelled to cover. So it just becomes a yeah. really problematic issue even though we all recognize the value of it yes okay that's it is interesting i'm sure it's going to come up again in in some of the questions we're going to get but simon um you know uh, you know you appreciate your your our sponsor for this webinar but as a as an independent perspective so to speak any thoughts on what you've heard um yeah i mean i i just um uh, Lucy talked about it assisting with performance and I think I think really um, team sport cricket has excellent values as a team sport but I think I think team sport might more widely is, is really important and um, because I actually I think it it helps you it teaches you to that you need to depend on other people uh, and at the same time those people need to depend on you um, and I think in order for people to want to depend on you you need to be trustworthy uh, and I think you need to be active or, or, or rather proactive um, and I think those two traits actually specifically for police officers is what the public really, really want, trust and action. Um, so I think um, I think sport in and of itself is is, is really critical um, mm. and um, to, to make sure that we, we have a police force that's active and, and, and effectively provides for our communities. So I think as, as well as the, the sort of well-being, I think it positions you um, marvellously as, as an individual to actually make progress. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I've got a question open here uh, from uh, Linda. How can we attract more corporate sponsorships to all sections of police sport via Team Police? Um, I don't know if anybody has any ideas there um, to answer that. So I said again, how can you get? How can we attract more sponsorships to uh, more corporate sponsorship to all sections of police sport via Team Police? Right. OK. Interesting one. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll open up the two. Uh, Mick, first, uh, what's your thoughts? How can uh, how can we get uh, uh, how can we attract more corporate sponsorship? Do you think? Um, well, it, it, it's it just it's just promoting sport and well-being, isn't it? Say, as uh, if if you've got more time and you you've got more money, then you're you're able maybe to get 
into the community more and and maybe interact through through, through sport as well i know um as obviously as a, a community support officer in in, in caldicott where where i am um we're just about to come up with asb week in in the next couple of uh, next couple of weeks and we'll be looking to do something in, in and around um well, I, I think we I think we're doing frisbee golf, we're doing football, and we're interacting with all the youth services just just to obviously mm. you know, pr promote it. So it, it's one one idea. Um, how successful it would be, I I don't know, but you know it certainly helps us engage with with the young with the younger younger kids in and around where we are in Gwent. That is for sure. Okay. Mandy, what's your thoughts on that in terms of how we're going to attract more sponsorship, corporate sponsorship? Yeah, I think I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? You know, um, I agree with Mick. I mean, it's, if there's something in the community that, that can be tapped into, then yeah. that's obviously a great starting point. Um, the question is always always going to be what's in it for them. Um, yeah. you know, why would you sponsor? Why would you sponsor a police team? You know, how much publicity mm -hmm. are you going to get as a consequence of it? Um, I think the fact that you know media is now there for us all to use, whether it's through the webinars, whether it's YouTube or whatever. Obviously, that's an attractive prospect too. But um, it's a challenge. I think it is a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. Simon, see you're our sponsor, and you're from the commercial sector. Any, any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from a commercial perspective, um, I think one is, 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 you know, asking for sponsorship from from businesses that are sort of, um, you know, focused towards a sort of public element um, and that sort of social values. Um, those types of businesses should should want to uh, to assist with things like that. Um, and, and then, as, as as Mandy said, you know, it, it, you know, most sponsors put it, um, you know, to get visibility for their brand um, amongst yeah. um you know compatriots so so i think yeah you know making it as 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 visible as you can um you know it's a fantastic um initiative so the more visibility you have that the more sponsors are going to want to have their brand associated with that um and i think cricket's a really a really good one because i think the values within a within cricket and and you know the fact that the crowd you know similar to rugby the, the crowd are allowed to sit there with beers and have a nice drink whilst they watch the game yeah. Um, it, it's the right um, atmosphere to have your brand associated with. Great, Lucy. Um, in terms of um, you know, PS UK and uh, uh, in terms of corporate sponsorship, how how's that sit at the moment? Do you think in terms of feeling comfortable about that? So I can't really answer on the PS UK because I'm not really very connected with that at the moment. Uh, but I I suppose. Some of the other areas of work that I've been dealing with um, where we've looked at corporate sponsorship, I mean, certainly with COVID, it's been really tricky. Um, yeah. And um, we've seen a regression of an interest in corporate um, sponsorship, sponsorship. I accept Simon's point. It's predominantly if people feel that there is a value for marketing their products, um, then obviously then they're, they're willing to be um, <clears throat> probably involved in it but certainly not to the sort of sums that people had invested in um previously so you know the draw for this very much has to be about pushing and uh, that social responsibility strand i think it's about looking for companies that are very well connected to well-being um and probably re really approaching it not necessarily through the lens of just sport mm. but sport and well-being uh, and looking at uh, approaching it in terms of the strategy uh, i i can't really comment on that to be honest well, gavin that would have been simon who strategically managed not to be able to dial in <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine that's fine lisa lisa what's our next question yeah as you can imagine we have a lot of questions uh, around the time off uh, thing and i i uh, I think one of the things that came to the front as well is is comparing, you know, maybe for sickness rates against time off for sports and using that uh, to to um, to to showcase the public that well being is very important there. Uh, and Bruce here in the comment box just said, and I think this is quite a nice one to discuss for the panel, is that do you think that the value has been recognised a little more since the pandemic hit? Uh, I get the impression from conversations with our police customers that the public have been more understanding of the mental well-being benefits of fitness and sport over the last few months because it became so much more important. Good, good, 
good point actually. What, what do we think then, guys? Do we think um, that, that dial's been turned slightly, that there's, a, there's more of a recognition of mental health, physical health, uh, through physical activity, now we're coming out of this appalling period of our lives? Mick, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it, well, I say I can only speak speak on behalf of my, my own force, and I, I've certainly seen a shift shift probably within the last 18 months um, in terms of the, the well-being sec section, yeah. in terms of you know the, the stresses of, of the job. At the end of the day, you you in between obviously dealing with family life, not seeing family, not being able to to you know visit funerals and you know bury loved ones properly in in the you know in a in a, in a dignified manner, um you know uh, and you when you go into work and then they expect you to you know. It, maintain high standards obviously keep going to work as well and you know initially it was a it was uh, a bit all over the place with PPE and, and I'm sure you know I'm, we're not yeah. the only force that you know struggled to deal with obviously the constant changes that, uh, that the government brought in at the time but uh, I'd like to think now that we've got a nice nice handle on it and uh, certainly from a from a Gwen perspective um, our, our well-being section is, is is probably the strongest it's been since I've been in, and I've been about 13 and a half years now. And more lines of communication, everything's a bit easier to access. Um, you know, your line managers are more aware of obviously everything that's going on as well, and but they're probably trained better now ultimately as well. So uh, mm. I would say it's I would say we are definitely going in the right direction. Good. What about you, Mandy? Yeah, I, I guess from my perspective, I see it from a, a slightly different viewpoint now, having yeah. having retired from the force, but now yeah. being involved um, enormously in the recruit pathway and the number of new officers that are now coming into the service and their expectations in terms of managing their well-being. Uh, and to be fair, a lot of them have joined you know, in the last year where, where their whole foundation training has been delivered pretty much online and that that presents a number of challenges as well and and now mm. they're starting now to experience what life is like as an operational police officer uh, yes. I cover Hampshire Surrey and Sussex and and you know that, that that's huge in terms of numbers that they're recruiting so going back to what you were saying earlier about how can we get that message out that's mm. perhaps another avenue is through that recruit pathway to, to to highlight to new people who are joining the service the real benefits of well-being because policing in terms of well-being has come such a long way um, the sport has pot potentially dropped off but there's a, there's the option to put it back there to complement what the force is trying to do to support their officers mm. Lucy as a chief do you think that dial's turned slightly since post well, that's not post yet, but as we as we start to slowly come out of the last 18 months and the, the demands on the service and on individuals, both personally and professionally, do you think that does change slightly in terms of recognising, I know it was there before, but more so now in terms of as a priority within the service for well-being? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, the focus on well-being now is unrecognizable to probably the mm. first 15 years of my my yeah. service really i think it's just you know it's just a in a completely different place to where it was for for many many years and i think it's had a bit of a seismic shift in the last sort of five to ten years certainly i i think 2017 for you know for many reasons if i if i take um the sort of terror attacks that took place across the yeah. Um, country in 2017 you know the sort of welfare provision whilst always there's things that we can do better but unrecognizable to to where we would have been you know even five ten years before that so I, I think the challenge that Covid has presented is um, you know recognizing you know particularly if we take you know we have had officers that are still coming into work um, and the challenges of working within that COVID landscape. But equally, we have to balance that against police staff that have been, you know, working in a, in a much more agile and flexible way from home. Actually, that's not necessarily great um, to be working in that way constantly. And I think there's often a temptation to look at home working through 
the lens of a house with a garden, your own space to work. And actually, for the majority of the workforce, that's simply not the case. And, you know, we've got people who are living, you know, rent a room um, in a house with a whole load of other people or are still living at home and they've just got their room. So, you know, it's definitely brought to the forefront the challenges of being adaptable in terms of the well-being offer that, that we make. And certainly if I, you know, if you look within British Transport Police, you know, we've seen a significant increase in the type of safeguarding work that officers are having to do and PCSOs. Um, we've seen a significant um, increase in the number of suicides or people presenting in precarious positions for suicide. And, you know, they all require, a, you know, frontline officers and PCSOs to responding to pretty horrific incidents. So, um, and, you know, I, I think the challenges will move, move forward for everybody is, you know, we've got another four weeks before we come out onto the roadmap. The furlough process is still in place at the moment, so we don't know about what the economic shift in the country is going to be. So I think there's a lot of un unknowns as we move forward. And, you know, what is nice is that sport has started ag again and the gyms are open and that. But just making yeah. sure that that provision is inclusive for everybody is really important. I agree more. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, um, should we go back to that, the question which we always ask then? Have we got that one anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, uh, you threw me off guard here because I was going to throw you a cricket question. Oh, come uh, on then, give to... me a cricket <laughs> question then. I, I cricket. thought to, to, to change the tone for a second. Um, yeah. what, for, <laughs> what further action is necessary to continue driving the cricket section forwards uh, to remain at the forefront of police sports? Wow. Cool. <laughs> I think you might have to throw that one to Nick or Mandy. <laughs> Mandy. Oh, well, uh, I've tried my bit with the tour in the number of sort of interviews yeah. and, uh, and bits of uh, information that are now out on the media. And, and I'm hoping that um, that will encourage, certainly from the ladies section, um, yeah. more engagement you know that's that's what we really need and and mixed tours coming up and and hopefully that will that will put those two areas of cricket um firmly at the at the forefront of, of police sport and um we'll, we'll see where it goes from there i guess and attract some and more sponsorship if we can as well if Indeed. we can do that as well uh, mick what about yourself and and uh, the men's team well obviously um uh, the, what Mandy did whilst on the women's tour this year in terms of the online interviews after post-match and things like that, it just gets more people viewing it, doesn't it? And the more people that see what's going on, again, you're more likely to attract yeah. sponsorship, which again, you're able to grow grow the sport because unfortunately in, in, in the world, it's, it's the money that does all the talking and allows you to do these things, isn't it? So I, I think yeah. what was introduced this year with, with Mandy and... Uh, on the women's tour, I, I, well, I'm pretty confident it'll be happening on the men's tour, and and, yeah. and it, 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 it'll, well, it might be a bit more entertaining, and it depends on you know whether I've had a beer or not after the match. But uh, it, it, uh, it, it's a real, you know, it's a real good week, and uh, I say fingers crossed, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go from strength to strength because you know we're we're really riding the crest of a wave at the moment. Be, be you know, driving it forward and obviously being part of team police, it's uh, it's certainly going to make cricket grow and just going from strength to strength at the moment from what I from what I've seen. Can I just ask a question? How important uh, is the tour, Meg, for cricket, police cricket? In, how, how, in, how, in, how in, terms, in terms of what? Just generally in terms of that question, which uh, Lisa put out in terms of projecting it and, you know, getting it out there. Um, and engaging with other teams. How how important is the, is the tour for the game? As I as I spoke about earlier, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm meeting all sorts of cricketers, all sorts of different people from you know from all around the the country. Um, and as you say when you know somebody in an opposite side, it just it just say it just you become part of a a bigger community don't you You become part yeah, of the, you know yeah. i'm part of the police service in gwent but you know i'm part of the gwent south yeah. wales team but i'm you know i'm part of the british police team i'm you know you are part of the the, the service and you you know 
when you're able to go and do these things, you just it 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 say it in terms of you know mental health and well-being. It's the highlight of my year. You know, going on going on tour that week, meeting up with some boy, some new faces, some old faces. You know, it's it's just absolutely cracking week for me. And say in terms of what it does for for myself, it it, it certainly energizes me to carry on running my section. You know, and keep wanting to do what I I want to do, and obviously be part of the committee and keep tr- doing my best to drive cricket forward within within police sport. Uh, that's really encouraging. As somebody has put here, it's a real badge of honour to represent uh, your police service in the national team. Yeah. But Man- Mandy, you've just finished a a, a tour. Uh, I've seen you on YouTube. How important was that tour? Do you think for for women's police cricket? How good was it? How important. Uh- Oh, how important. I think it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think it's been something that, you know, has perhaps been a long time in in trying to be put together. And now that it's put together, um, I think it will only gain more and more momentum. I said earlier that uh, the players come from a broad cross spectrum of, of all forces, which I think is tremendous. You know, there's there's pretty much the majority of forces represented. And, and I'm hoping that as conversations start happening within cricket teams so ladies who play cricket will probably chat to people in their in their clubs and they know that perhaps they're in another force and that will encourage someone to come and play for, yeah, yeah, for yeah. a british police and so it's that it's that communication but the real team ethos the camaraderie the enthusiasm and for me uh the switch off from the job and that's yeah, the bit yeah. for me that is that is so um fantastic because people will always talk job when you meet people who are in the job they yeah. tend to talk job but yeah. this was about cricket and, yeah. you know, it was great to have that and, and a real switch off, I think, for the stresses and strains and challenges that are now present in, in everyday policing. Yeah, thank you. Lisa, have we got uh, another yes, question? You do. Yeah. Oh, I've got m- m- many. Um, uh, this is a question that was actually sent in um, by email before the webinar. So this is from Lewis Lincoln Gordon uh, from West Mercia. Uh, he says, given the stresses and pressures that staff have faced during the p- pandemic, can the panel outline their views on why forces differ so diff- so significantly on the role sports can play in the health and well-being of their staff? In your view, how can we reach a national consensus and therefore a level playing field across all forces? Which plays into what we've been talking about again, but slightly mm. in a different uh, approach. How does that affect um, in terms of, you because know, you're, you're two national police team captains. So how does that sort of inconsistency, I suppose, across the service, how does that affect in terms of being able to engage players and organise teams and, and, uh, and tours and such like? Mick, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, obviously, police leave is, is a big, big hot topic um, at the moment. And say... From my, my perspective, um, Gwent give fifty percent back. So uh, in terms of leave, so if I if if I'm not on a on a rest day and I'm able to obviously our, our staffing levels require a, a, a high enough, then obviously I can go off and play sport and I get fifty percent back. South Wales differ. Again, I think they get a couple of days special leave and then after that you've got to use your own annual leave. I know some places, some forces, you've got to use your own leave. So I, I think if we can make it generic across all forces and make it a, a level playing field I think you will get far more participation and again a, a higher standard of cricket ultimately and a higher level of sport ultimately as well. Mandy what's your thoughts on this? Yeah I think um, Mick makes a valid point um, I think if I asked the majority of the players from the from the ladies tour that they would say they would use their own annual leave to come and play cricket such was the the enthusiasm to be part of it and I think that's that's to their credit and that's that's you know that's fantastic to hear that um I guess the part of it is actually getting the leave in the first place and um you know encouraging people to to be aware that this exists in order for them to submit their leave in in the timely fashion that you need to be able to get get released uh that's a difficulty but I think the fact people are prepared to give some leave is, is something that should be credited yeah, so there's a comment here um, about uh, police, uh, police forces give players uh, sports duty credit, which greatly assists in terms of facilitating to play. Um, some have to take annual leave, which sometimes does cause friction 
and impacts on uh, family and personal time. So it's yes, it's, this is a this has been a common theme for all the webinars. Lu Lucy, it, it, inevitably, I was going to come back to you to ask you about this question. I know you can't speak for you know all chiefs on this, but just really your thoughts on this as to you know is this something where a, a debate or something can be undertaken to try and see if we can iron out a a, a, a common approach to this. Yeah, I mean, I do like your optimism, uh, particularly from uh, Mick, but I, I think it would be really difficult to get a consensus across UK policing around this, you know, I mean, obviously each force is independent in its own right, you know, the scrutiny is applied by police and crime commissioners, there's a couple of forces like my own that have a police authority, you know, certainly if you take BTP, officers are contracted, um, the contract is agreed approved by a police authority so there are a lot of stakeholders um mm. involved in understanding what the policies um are and you know i i come back to you know it's probably different because there's probably you know this the sort of sentiments that people pick up from probably how it would be felt um in the force is probably different in some forces um than others and the resilience of some forces to be able to deliver operations um, is greater or, or lesser in, in some forces and they will take all of that into consideration when and you know I think the Welsh example is a prime prime example of the difference that's there and some of that's probably mm. rightly there because of the operational variance in the way in, the way, in what the, the individual forces have to deliver from a demand perspective. Um, mm. I, I and, and also you can't you know we're not just talking about people absenting for one or two sports you know there's a magnitude of sports out there and most of us know colleagues that are involved in sports and you know I suppose if you compare it to the private sector I mean it'd be interesting to ask Simon you know I if you look across industry you know industry equally are not releasing people in abundance to do to do sports you know people are expected to find their own time to do that and balance that which is really which is really 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 difficult and I, and I accept that but you know at the end of the day we you know as chiefs we own you know control the public purse the public mm. money that's been afforded to us as senior leaders to deliver a service to the public and we have to balance that and I, I don't think it is as clear as just creating time for individuals it's all the others the other people that have to mm. fill the mm. gaps that is mm. really important and you know there are points of during the annual calendar where if you were to aggregate all sport together it would be it would be quite a significant abstraction um, mm. particularly for some smaller forces I would imagine so mm. I, I think that people try to flex you know so you know you are right some of the policies are different in different forces some take a slightly um, more progressive um, and in, in inclusionary approach to it you know others are, are really clear that the the impact of that um you know isn't isn't favorable and therefore the well-being consciousness is is probably dealt with in different ways mm. it's also Thanks. injuries from sports you know i mean we have quite a few yeah. cases where people are saying you know i injured myself playing this can you speed up the nhs process or can you you know assist with some funding um, for that and, the, and again that's that's something you, I suppose you have to take into consideration although they're not high numbers. Yeah yeah interesting. So, Simon what's your thoughts on this from again from the independent perspective? Yeah I mean I think I think in the I think in the sort of um, non-public sector world and, and probably outside policing I think the challenges are probably quite unique to policing I mean um, we as a tech organization are sort of very much about sort of you know, people working from where they want to work and 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 making time um, that allowing them to manage their own time and, and and really encouraging sort of sport and well-being and whatever else people want to do, yoga, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I but I know from a, you know policing obviously faces its own unique challenges with shifts and you know finding people to cover those. And I've got a few friends that are police officers and and you know just um sort of getting them out to play sport or inviting them on holiday and is always a challenge because they've got to sort of try and change those those shift patterns um around and then and then that can be cancelled at the last minute so I, I think um 
I think really uh, from a, from an outside perspective, um, it's really about trying to instill within within everyone the sort of um, uh, the benefits of sports, so that everyone sort of has that camaraderie to say yes I'll, I'll cover this or I'll, I'll help help with that and uh, you know and that it that it sort of goes both ways I guess it's 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 team police but it's also sort of team sport um, in that sense and and maybe that helps in terms of freeing up people's people's time to do it but I, I do understand completely that the the challenge is much greater in a in in a in an organization such as such as the police. Yeah, I, I suspect this Gordian knot of a theme, which we've had now for a number of times, is not going to go away anytime soon. I think this is something which, um, well, we'll feed it back to PSUK to, to think about. And But it's certainly, it's certainly come across very strongly, hasn't it, Lisa? So I think every single webinar we've done, actually, from everybody that's yeah. engaged with I us. Have a, I have a bunch more questions that basically come to the same thing. Um, really? so it's something that really keeps people up at night uh, and that and 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 retired police officers having access to to certain uh, certain police sports facilities that's what that's the most recurring thing that we see yeah that, that's that, that's what I think we've addressed quite a bit actually but, <laughs> but, um, exactly can retired police officers play in police teams Mick yeah, yeah, I've I've got um, I've got two within my squad at the moment who I who I call upon when uh, when when needed. To say the yeah. benefit with that one is they don't need to take any leave, so uh, it works out quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what <laughs> that might be one way. <laughs> Matt, Mandy, have you? <laughs> I just think that's one way of solving the last one. <laughs> just on the team for the retired officers. <laughs> well, I hope uh, I, I hope retired officers are allowed to continue to play because I am retired. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but I've got another job. So I take my annual leave. Obviously, it's not given to me. I take my own annual leave because I want to yeah. support this cause because uh for me it's not about the benefits i can get from it but it's the benefits to others uh, and of if course. i can contribute in some way then then that's my contribution to to a job that i have loved for 30 odd years so so yeah uh, if, if retired officers can continue then i'm happy to continue brilliant brilliant lisa have we got any, anything else from yeah the... i think i think uh leading in a, on a little bit from from what simon was saying earlier from the, the team sports and we have a question here from catherine and i think that's the catherine who's also leading on on one team active uh so we should should we invest time in the new young workforce to change the culture uh, getting them to engage in sports through basic training and taking it into the workplace to support the well-being and team benefits of sport so that's a good question actually how do we um, get there <laughs> there's, the fitness, there's the fitness test which everybody has to adhere to and i know it, there's you know in certain other occupations i think the armed forces obviously fitness is a key aspect of requirement for it and so is policing but in terms of encouraging uh, when you join other service into sport um you know d does that happen or can we do more to do that in uh, in the first place um mandy do you want to start with that uh, yeah, well, obviously, I, I'm involved at that that route yeah, now yeah. into policing through the recruit program, and um, uh, certainly the well-being element is definitely there uh, because of the recruit pathway now and, and having to get a degree and on all the rest of it that comes along with it, and that's a real challenge for people who are now entering the, the service. Um, uh, in terms of what each individual force does with that, I, I don't know, um, but I think that's something that probably can be picked up, definitely. Um, mm. It's fair, I think, to say that perhaps that's changed, the culture maybe has changed slightly. Um, you know, the challenges now in life are quite different, I think, for people, you know, family commitment, so on and so forth. Um, it, it, it has changed, and I think that's something we need to recognise. That's not to say that we can't shift it. But it is slightly different now, I think, than maybe when I joined and some other people that are on, on this panel. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, what I certainly I'm I just reflect on the time I think Lucy referred to it earlier on, in my time when I joined the, 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 the service, you know, there was a conversation about what sport did you play and what sports do you want to be part of? Uh, I you know, I just wonder whether that, that conversation takes place now. Mick, Mick, what's your reflections on that? I, I go and speak from 
again personal experience yeah, yeah. experience i say i 13 and a half years ago i joined and and it was basically sign this form if you want to be part of the sports section we do a number <laughs> of different sports and if you want to use our gyms pay pay your pay your monthly fee yeah, yeah no problem whatsoever so that that was pretty much it at the time i'd say since then you know we've now got intranets obviously i you know we meet meet at our annual agms and stuff like that so uh it works it's it's working better and going in the right direction as you, uh, you know and obviously with mandy being involved with, with the forces that she's involved with say i think it's highlighted far earlier now and uh, i say i can remember you know a couple of couple of stories from uh, a couple of people who obviously rugby's mad in in wales but you know if you're a good rugby player you know you you know, back in the day, you didn't necessarily have to fill in an application form. You know, it was uh, what you know. You know, so it's, it's obviously since changed from that, from that way. But uh, I we I think we include every type of sport um, far far earlier within within the force and certainly within the training school now. Yes, but what I'm just I'm just thinking on this actually. How how do we, Mandy? I'm just thinking. How how would we pick up? You know, the next. Um, you know, somebody like, you know, a Heather Knight who plays a good standard of cricket, decides to join the police service. Um, how, how would she find out, you know, that not knowing anything about the police service and, and whether the police runs cricket? How, 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 would, how would she be picked up other than just being by word of mouth at the moment? Um, I think people who have a love of sport, probably wherever they wherever they find their career path is, you know, whether you're in the police yeah, or any other yeah. organisation, would probably seek out what internal sports network is there for them. Um, and so it's, it's perhaps that personal element as well. But through conversations, if people know that you play a specific sport, then that's how the message gets cascaded round. I mean, the old the old fashioned notice boards in the police stations, you know, they're, they're probably not the same as they used to be. And, um, no. you know, it, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, it it's yeah. encouraging, Lucy, it's encouraging people to, to engage in sport. I, I can remember a previous webinar we had where I think it was one of the sports clubs up north had somebody who tried out archery for the first time and then three years later is com competing at national and international level um, and had never been engaged in sport at all in the first place. Is this something which, you know, again, Forces or PS UK can help give a steer to perhaps uh, make sure that that opportunity is available for everybody? Those, not only those who are passionate about sport, but perhaps encouraging people to do something. And this might be something. And, you know, Catherine has asked the question, is working on something like that through uh, One Team Active at the moment. I mean, I'm not, I mean, Simon would have answered on the sort of PSU UK perspective, but I mean, I think there's something about looking at how um, other institutions and organizations approach this. So, if, I mean, obviously a natural place to go to, to look at this is universities. How do they attract people in often? whether some of them are campus-based, some of them aren't campus-based, and they're looking at yeah, how they yeah. reach across a huge audience of people to encourage them to come in, you know, and, you know, give up study time to actually play sport. So I think, and, and my sort of understanding of that is there's an awful lot of outreach via social media. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of social media, police social media influencers. And I think there is something about how probably PSUK uses them more in terms of making it clear what the offer is that's out there. You know, people may choose to do it or not do it, but how that yes. they can actually access sport across uh, policing. I mean, it's a very, I mean, I know everybody's saying it's, it's a very inclusionary thing, but it, it's very, it's done very much on a, you know, a police, uh, individual police forces if you work for them you play for them but actually some people particularly in the south and everything actually live outside of where the force mm. is so you know probably as we move forward it needs a bit more flexibility of thinking as to you know are you a bit of a sinner and step over the line and actually it's easier <laughs> to play for the force where you live than it is yeah, for the yeah. force where you work it's a good point actually I'm that. yes you're right you're right Okay, um, Lisa, have we got um, uh, have we got time for probably a couple more questions before I ask for some final remarks? <laughs> I'm not sure whether I've got any more, but I do have a comment here from Paul Sims who says that in his fours in Staffordshire, 
Uh, he works uh, in the new recruits training and has the chance to speak to all new recruits. And he sells for sports and the uptake has been fantastic, including two female student officers setting up their uh, staff's first women's, uh, women's football section. So that's great to hear well, that, um, that's that a good he's example, having some though. success. That's a fantastic example and one that should be sort of, you know, maybe um, uh, brought up as an example for others if they're not doing that. I think Absolutely. what I'd like to, my, my last question really to, to you is the future. Um, again, let's go back to the, the, the theme of the webinar, Anyone for Cricket. Well, where do you see the future of police cricket? Where would you like to see it be in the future, um, Mick? Um, well, say it's uh, from where where I started. Uh, it's just gone from strength to strength. To say it's would, I'd like us to be part or, or certainly recognised. I know uh, I'd say, and it, it maybe selfishly but looking at it, but you know, the army, the, the RAF, the navy, they get to play at Lords every year. You know, why 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 can't we? You know, I'd love to see that. Um, it would be, you know, from from. From uh, obviously the men's and the and the women's perspective, it would be it would be a, a you know it's obviously an honour honour to be British police captain. But God, what a what a memory that would be to be able to you know play a game at Lords, whilst effectively representing re representing your country. It uh, that would be a, a, a massive stride forward, I think, to be recognised uh, nationally. That would would be. I know we do play them, but. Uh, you say they obviously have their armed forces day. It would be nice to be to be part of that. It really would. Um, everything. I think what we're doing and say we have healthy discussions every year. Um, and obviously, Beef's got you know constant contact through obviously Simon, Simon and, and myself about how we want to progress the the section uh, or each section really. And say with the condensing from the draw of being. You could be get drawn any anywhere to play in effectively local your local forces and then progressing through the tournament i think is, uh, has been a real good benefit to the section um obviously we've we've had a bit of time off due to due to covid but i think we're only going from strength to strength and you know the cricketers that we're, we're, we're producing or we're able to play now um and I, i'm hoping to see it in uh Come come Sunday, um, with the squad that we got, that we will be playing some. You know, we we've had you know we've had some great cricketers over the year, but I think this this week I'd be looking to play some pretty serious cricket against some pretty serious sides as well, and really really hold ourselves to a real high standard. Brilliant, thank you, Mick. Mandy, where do you see future for uh, women's police cricket? Yeah, I, th I think the prospects are very good. Um, the the tour huge success. Uh, we've laid those early foundations and it's a question of building on those foundations now going forward, spreading the word. Uh, I agree completely with Mick. I think, you know, uh, what an honour it would be to play at some some real top quality venues, Lords or, or wherever that might be. Um, now, I know David Fraser Darling's on this and he's listening. So, Dave, <laughs> take note. Yes. Uh, and, and also conversations I've had, you know, the MCC ladies, they've got a team. I think that should be somebody yeah. else that we have included on our list. Uh, so the Army, the Navy, the RAF, MCC. I mean, I think that would be fantastic set up if, if that's possible uh, and to play at locations that, again, highlight the existence of it can only bring positives and more people to, to join it, whether it's from a playing perspective, coaching perspective. I mean, I think it would be great to have perhaps some female coaches involved. Uh, we, we, we had Andy with us, which was tremendous, but it's actually also selling the other benefits, the wider police family. If you're not a player, but you've got something you can contribute, then we want to hear from you. Thank you, Mandy. Lucy, I'll leave you to have the last uh, say in terms of just some quick reflections in terms of what you think, in terms of where you see the future. Uh, well, it's really interesting because as I sit here, my daughter's just walked in having come back from school and just listened. And she tells me the future is about mixed teams. So I don't know how popular that is oh, right. or not. So that that's the take of a 15 year old who's who's who the boys team have just come second in the county. So um, but that's that's their view within school that the team should become mixed. So. With limited knowledge of cricket, I just put that out there because I um as just a, a sort of is that where we'll be in fifteen years time or or not question mark. So I think the future for me, 
I, I, you know, I've really enjoyed listening to everybody. I think some of the challenge probably for the future is, you know, how do we, um, you know, use uh, the police cricket to sort of connect with some of the harder to reach communities? Because um, I think what I'm hearing is about leadership, teamwork, a family, all of those positive traits that, that actually, you know, we have got, um, you know, have got the opportunity to sort of take that to local communities to help. Um, and I'm not so sure what the that sort of strand of the sort of police cricket is at the moment. And also, you know, Mandy, as I, I look at you as a role model, you know, how do we use your sort of um, experiences to, and think about some of that intergenerational mentoring of leaders within policing today and female leaders in policing today? And how can you bring that closer together as opposed to just focus on, 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 a, on a sport or a tour, but what are those other sort of collateral benefits that could, could exist? Uh, and I suppose, you know, finally for me is just, you know, recognising the value of wellbeing. Cricket has an offer to, um, to make and how, how do we influence forces to think about sport more broadly, but actually put um, cricket pretty front and centre in relation to that and I think it'd be nice to think about if there are more things that we need to be doing to influence at a national um, level um, and I suppose the future for me is just uh, certainly trying to understand it a bit more so I think I'll probably need a bit of a zoom lesson Mandy so because I'm quite competitive so you'll need to give me a bit of a <laughs> bit of a lesson offline sometime I think that'd be great. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, well, it, it just remains for me to um, just to uh, uh, finish this uh, webinar. Um, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Thank you, Mick. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Lucy, for your contributions um, to this webinar. Um, really, really interesting. Um, I think some things that have come out of this, which we'll pick up from this and we'll summarise. And obviously, as I said to Obviously, the webinar will go through social media as well outside this. I would like to thank particularly uh, Simon from Anatomap. Thank you. Uh, without this, as I said before, we couldn't do this. So we are so grateful for your support um, as one of our business sponsors. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, it re really is valuable. I'd like to thank uh, Lisa, who basically makes this happen, and um, and Sardines for engagement, who support us on this, and um, um, another colleague, Catherine, who is behind the scenes, who again has done a lot of work with Lisa to try and make this happen as well. Um, and lastly, just a little plug point, I think, Mick, am I right in thinking that the national final is on the 8th of September? The police, national police cricket finals, it is, I think, it is on, yes, it's on the 8th yeah. of September. Yeah. yeah. So there's a bit of a plug there for anybody who's interested, who wants to come and look at um, um, uh, police cricket on the 8th of September, then there, there's a date to put in your diary. Um, so it just reminds me to say thank you, everybody, for coming on the webinar. Um, I wish you uh, um, safe, well, wherever you're going from here on. And on behalf of Team Police, thank you for joining us. <laughs>